coffee. I really love coffee. What's up everybody and welcome to uh, Arganian's Puzzle Box. Um, in today's video, I wanted to do something that would definitely help um, people out who want to do cinematic rendering in Unreal Engine 5. This particular tutorial focuses on uh, how to set up a scene uh, for rendering cinematics, uh, especially screenshots or even the video. It goes for very specific settings that might help you get the best image quality out there as well. Uh, it will help you with reducing uh, memory overhead. It will help you with crashes in case you're, you're having crashes when you're trying to render. This should help you out. It's going to, to give you the basics of how to use a movie sequencer and how to set up a camera within the sequencer that then loads with the actual opening of your sequence itself. Um, overall, I think it's quite detailed, but not complex enough that it will scare you away. I think um, you, you'll definitely get quite a, quite a bit of valuable information out of this. If you have any suggestions or feedback to make, please go ahead. I'm, I'm really open to ideas and to new uh, sort of angles of, of viewing um, uh, such a topic uh, as the movie sequencer, which I know is something that a lot of people struggle with. Uh, now, remember, if you're interested and you want to be a part of Arganian's Puzzle Box's platform, you can join the Discord server. You can also go on our station, Gumroad, we have Patreon to get one of my projects or all of my projects. It really depends. Uh, you've got my full support. So, yeah, let's not delay it any longer and we'll begin the tutorial straight after this very short commercial. If you want to support the Arganian's Puzzle Box channel, please consider purchasing one of my projects from our station or Gumroad. It's literally the price of a coffee and it gives you a fully fledged space project to use in Unreal Engine. And there's also some Blender options in there as well. Also, you can become a Patreon member or YouTube member, and then you get access to these projects anyway. So consider that maybe if you want to support me, but let's not waste any more time and let's begin. Okay. Now we've um, I've opened the uh, latest project that I've done, the latest map. Uh, this is a um, animated nebula volume um, set, which we've got like six sky boxes in it. Um, this particular project contains um, a black hole blueprint, a planet blueprint, and also the sky box blueprint, which is fully configurable. And it has six sky boxes that you can see in here that can be added. Um, the reason why I've chosen this particular uh, project to open apart from my sort of uh, self-indulgent uh, uh, bit of uh, commercial, but it's also because it is a cinematic type of um, scene. You know, I, I would use something like this to shoot a cinematic and Unreal Engine. And I believe that this particular tutorial will work quite uh, good in here. Now, what you'll notice is that I've also got five blueprints with the camera. And these are made by me uh, purely because I want to be able to control certain aspects of these cameras and also be able to add special effects within them if I wanted to. Now, if I can, if I select, um, you know, one to three of them or even one to five, but only three of them will display. As you can see right here at the bottom, the what the camera sees, I will be able to see in this particular uh, viewport. This is trying to show me exactly uh, what every camera is seeing at any given point. This is very useful because you can also pin these, um, these sort of views, which then means that whatever you do, even if you deselect the cameras, you'll still be able to see what they were being able, what they were, um, you know, particularly uh, seeing at the time. And then you can also find them in here and as you can um, as you can see if i just select the camera that actually has that i'll be able to move it around um with if i move it in within the 3d scene so as you can see that one there is moving so that's very that's very useful overall but um you know you can as i said you can pin these down but then you can also unpin them if you want them to disappear and this is very useful to see sort of live feed from the cameras that you're using um, but I don't, you know, as a, as a beginner, especially if you're starting to just, just start out to use movie sequencer, I wouldn't recommend you dropping in cameras within the, the scene like this, because, 
um, they tend to sometimes not function with the movie sequence at all, like they're not recognized and you may not know why that's happening. So then removing these and creating them within the sequencer makes a lot more sense to me if you were a beginner. So I'm just going to delete these and now we're left with a, you know, a directional light, the post-process volume and my blueprint. Now the post-process volume, we'll go through that in, a, in just a bit, but basically you want to drop that in here from our... Um, um, sorry, from our vol visual effects uh, you got here, post-process volume. And if you will notice, if I deactivate it, that's how the scene looks like without any post-process volume. So you can see how much of a difference this makes by just enabling this and adding some settings in here, which we'll go through uh, later so I can emphasize on what makes your scene, uh, you know, what will make your scene look more cinematic. Now, uh, I'm just going to control um, space to open the um, content browser and I'm going to go in this folder called camera work. I'm going to create a new sequence in here. So by right clicking, you'll be able to find it under animation over into here. You've got level sequence. So click that and I'm just going to call this tutorial sequence. I'm going to double click it and this will open a new window. So very quickly, the main things that you need to know about this window is that this is a timeline right here. You can set up the F, the FPS, the frame per second for the timeline over here. So I'm going to put that to 24 FPS for film. Unreal Engine will automatically calculate this timeline to match that FPS. So if I increase that, for example, to 60, you'll notice the timeline numbers have changed because Unreal Engine assumes you still want to have the same length of um, of the video coming out, but at 60 FPS. So if I put this to 24, you'll see the numbers changes because this is how many frames it will take to be able to do the same amount of time in 24 uh, FPS. Uh, then you've got these controls over here, which the uh, first here and the, and well, not the last, but almost the, um, the, the one before the last will allow you to set how big this timeline is. So if I go over here and I press this button, you'll notice the timeline has now been moved to 069. Uh, but I'm just going to control Z to go back. So this button is, um, you know, lets you set up where you want it to start. Uh, these other buttons are pretty much self-explanatory, you know, play, reverse, um, this will take you to the back of the timeline, sorry, yeah, the front of the timeline, sorry, this will take you to the back of the timeline, and this will move you through key animations, which we're going to add in just a second. Um, so if you want to add a camera within the sequencer, which will be a camera that only exists when you open this sequencer, as we've obviously saved the sequencer uh, over in here in this folder, um, so when I double click that, the camera will only show up if the sequencer is opened. So we can press this button and this will add a new camera. And this camera will also be set as the viewport because we have this option enabled here. Um, and then if we would press this button here where it says camera cuts, then you would still see the same thing. Because what this does, if you add any other camera cuts in here, it will move your your viewport will then default to those camera cuts depending on what frame on the timeline you're in. Uh, but this particular button will only keep you locked to the active uh, camera, which is this one right now. You can rename this if you want by right-clicking and selecting um, a rename or pressing F2 on the keyboard. Um, you can add more elements within here that are not generated via the sequencer by pressing this track button. So as the, the most common usage here will be to go to actor to sequencer and then just selecting uh, something from your scene. Like I could add the black hole, the planet, the star, the star sky, sky box that I've got in the scene if I wanted to be able to change some settings to those as I animate. But for now, we've got our camera and the most important things in here is the transform button, which allows you to move the location of this camera. So if I would go to, uh, you know, the first frame and I press this button over here, you'll see that it has dropped three dots. Uh, these dots relate to location, rotation, and scale. So now we know what the coordinate for that is. And if I then go, let's say over here and maybe in the, you know, because I've got my, ac my camera active, I can actually in the viewport, I can actually move it around. Let's say I just move it around and go towards this direction. And you'll notice that new keyframes have been added. But in your case, this might not work at all. And that's because you probably don't have this automatic key creator when you do anything with the uh, with an element within the scene. So if as long as this button is pressed, which in my case it is, 
it will automatically add keyframes to whatever sort of uh, setting you've changed, which is very useful and very quick to do. Um, if, because if I have that disabled, uh, let's say I go back in here, for example, like that, and I just move around my camera a bit, you'll see nothing has been saved. The moment I move the timeline, the camera reverts to its to the track that it was trying to follow. And this is the particular track that it's trying to follow. Uh, as you can see, it's sort of doing you know, some odd animation like that. Um, now you can add multiple cameras. So you can press this button over here to add a second camera. Now this camera, we can't actually, you know, right now, if I press this button, this button to revert to this camera over here, I can now pretty much go over like that, let's say. So I'm seeing something else on the viewport. And if I press this camera and I activate this little button over here, then you'll notice that the now I'm seeing what this second camera is actually seeing. Um, so if I press then this button over here, you'll notice that the second camera, we can't see it at all because it's not part of the camera cut. So if I go somewhere around here, let's say, and I press this plus button, um, this, you know, I've got no option here to be able to add it over there into the camera cut. But if I press the camera cut button and select the cameras, the second camera, you'll now notice that my camera will switch in the viewport to the new one. So that's a very simple way of doing things. Now, um, and you know, obviously we did a very basic animation on the camera as well. Uh, I don't want to go too much in depth into that because overall, I think you'll have to experiment yourself and there are plenty of other videos that, that you know, go in depth with how to animate cameras and other objects and sequence it. But for me, it's more like setting it up. So I'm just going to do a setup for, uh, screenshots. Maybe let's do it for, five, for two screenshots. Now, one thing in here is that. Uh, we've got a big timeline and to start dragging it down or something like that and then, you know, making it be two frames long is not exactly ideal. So what you want to do instead, you want to go over here and you've got uh, this on, on this drop down menu, you've got a start and an end button. So at the start, um, you want to click that number and put it to zero. Well, you can put it to two and basically that will make it be only two frames long. And I'm just going to go to the beginning and control zoom in. And that takes me over here. Now this is, I've only literally, I'm only got two frames, but in the second frame, I want to put my second camera and now I've done so. So uh, literally on first frame, we've got this camera and on second frame, we've got this camera. Now on the first frame, I'm just going to uh, activate this camera and I'm going to move it a bit so I can get a better sort of shot. I don't know. Um, maybe something like, I'm not really sure, maybe something like that. But one thing you'll notice is that the resolution on this camera, the, the, the focal view is not really great. So I can select it over here in the viewport and change this to a DSLR. And I'll do the same thing for this. And now I've got a better sort of a better view of what I'm trying to achieve. So let's say I want to do, I want to do a screenshot, maybe like this, you know, and then, uh, I'm just going to go to this one and maybe I want to do, I don't know. Well, I'm just going to take the, the blue, the black hole out and maybe do something. Sorry. Let me just change the speed down and go a bit up and do something like that. I don't know, make, maybe make it look like it's planet side, you know, like in the sense of I've, I'm on a planet and I'm seeing this sort of thing forward, right? So that's two frames. Uh, that's, uh, sorry, one. And you know what I've done now? I actually did not have the key active and I moved these uh, cameras around and it didn't actually save. So, and that's because I did, uh, I did have this animation. So I'm just going to delete those because they've obviously gotten they've got in my way and I don't like it. <laughs> so I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna reposition this to where I wanted it, which was definitely further away. It was something like, like that. This was for camera one. And then I'm just gonna go into camera uh, two. And in camera two, let me just go back to that planet surface. Cause I really sort of like that effect and get a bit closer to it. Um, yeah, something like that, maybe. Okay, so 
that's yeah that's 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 right now that's camera one and that's camera two okay this is what we've set up to make some screenshots now um for sequencer to look good um you'll definitely want to set up some settings within it and we can do that by adding a pipeline for, to it in the uh, sequencer what you want to do you want to click this uh, button over here where it says render this movie to a video or image frame sequence and this will open a new page called the movie render queue now you'll notice some things it tells you what camera it's going to shoot from but it's also saying that it's an unsaved configuration here and also a project directory to where it will save anything that it renders so I'm going to press the unsaved config and this will open a configuration panel. Now, depending on what sort of format you want to use to export your, um, uh, your sequence, you can use JPEG or other sort of um, exports, but I normally use PNG for this. So I'm just going to press the setting button and I've got this option here where it says PNG sequence. Now you can also do something like, um, you know, obviously you can see all these formats in here. PMP, XR, um, but normally, as I said, I am just using a PNG sequence. Now, that's pretty much done in that respect in the sense that you don't need to do anything else to the export, but you do have some options in here that you can add. So some of the options, one, one, of, the, one of the most powerful things that you can do to enhance your image is to add some custom commands to the sequencer. And I would advise that you keep a screenshot of this and set up in set it up in your own project it will help you in the future so you've got this option is here where it says console variables and once you add that you can then type in some console variables in here by adding some elements right so you can add you know once you added one element you can't add another one until you've actually made anything you know with something with it so you can put that r dot motion um i've got them all written over here so more motion uh, blur quality and obviously this at zero is the lowest quality but if you put this to five that's the highest quality of motion blur that unreal engine will produce for you um, then you want to have r dot motion blur and then you add separable se separable at the end and you increase that to one and this will help with the uh, sort of the the uh, in movement, when you see when you see the um, multiple objects sort of uh, overlapping with each other, this will help the motion blur look a lot better. Then you're going to, I mean, that's at least from my sort of experience that I saw. Then you can add depth of field um, quality, which will obviously increase that. This will only apply if you actually have any depth of field within the scene. This really helps when you're trying to do sort of shots from up close to a subject, but then you have depth of field in the background this, uh, or, or around the subject where there's no focus. Um, and then you can add uh, bloom quality. So this is uh, bloom. This is the quality of the bloom. Obviously, uh, this normally has more of an impact if you're using default bloom, uh, not convolution bloom from uh, the post process volume. And then we can add an art dot tone mapper, and then again just put into quality. Uh, and then this is to five. You then want to add another one. This is these are quite a few that you're trying to do. Uh, R dot tone mapper uh, dot sharpen. So you want to increase the quality, the, the sharpness of that tone mapper as well. Put that to one. And then you got R dot, and this only applies if you're using Lumen. But you've got uh, Lumen dot reflections. One second, I'm not really seeing these very properly. And then max roughness. Um, let me just get this right. Honestly, I'm not seeing these letters very good because I'm a bit further away from the screen than usual. Uh, roughness, and then you want to put two trace like that. And then you put that to one. Um, and then you can add another volume, another option, the last one, which is R dot lumen dot reflections dot temporal and you put that you leave that to zero and the with these console variables you'll get some really nice um a sort of look to your scene uh, when you render especially if you're going to use the next tip that i'm going to give you which is to use an anti-aliasing so with that uh, with that in mind with uh, the, the way the anti-aliasing is, is being used in this particular case so once you add it um, you'll be able to put your um, temporal sample count 
to you know, you can read it to one point to eight or sixteen. Sixty four is by far the best setting that you can use. But I when this you know, if you're doing screenshots, you want to do it at sixty four. Just remember, for every frame that you're rendering, it's going to actually go sixty four times through it. Sample at sixty four times to get you one frame to make it look as good as possible. Uh, and then you may want to use some render warm up frames as well when you do this, so you get the best result. And then you definitely want to stick over the option override the anti aliasing and leave it to none, so that it gives you the best anti aliasing setting that you can have. Uh, so once you do uh, once you do all of that, let's assume for argument's sake that you're running out of video memory while you're rendering this, depending on what sort of resolution you've put in the output. So this is the output is where you decide what resolution you want to do. And if you want to do, for example, you know, 4K, you can literally have 1920 times two, and this will, by the way, automatically sort of put it to two, to 4K like that. Uh, it's telling you where it's going to um, to um, output the screenshots, which in, the, in my case is in the folder, the directory of where this project is saved. You don't really need to mess about with any other sort of setting in here. But for the anti-aliasing, leave it at that. As I said, if you run out of video memory, you may want to add another option called high resolution. And what this allows you to do is you can put this tile count to two, and what it will do, it will actually now render one frame um, in two separate images and combine them so that you don't run out of video memory because it's trying to only now do half of an image at a time rather than the whole image. Uh, and you can do this at four as well, but just remember the more you, encounter, you in increase this number, the longer it will take to render as well. Uh, in my case, I don't need to use this, but just so you bear in mind, this is a good option for you to be able to export your image in case you've got problems with that. Another option that you can add is uh, called Game Overrides. And with this option added, um, you can obviously um, name it, you know, you can have a, you can have like a, uh, I believe, I'm not sure I've ever created one of these game mode overrides thing, but I think it's just sort of uh, overrides some of the settings automatically. But this one uh, assures that you've got cinematic quality settings being used. Um, so that would be over here when in settings when you go, uh, I'm not sure if you can see this, but there's like the material quality and all that and engine scalability over here. Those are set to whatever, low, high, medium. But this ensures that that option that you just saw there ensures that this will be cinematic always. You're also dis disabling any texture streaming. So you're not going to have this issue where some textures might be blurred as it loads them in because this is a render, a cinematic render. So you don't need to worry about textures being blurry unless, again, you're running out of VRAM like crazy, at which point I would just recommend you use the high resolution option. Uh, nothing else would really need to be changed from here. Just leave it as it is in case, uh, unless you want to do some other changes to it. Um, but I would say um, the deferred rendering, you need to leave this here. Don't touch it. I wouldn't play around with it. Just leave it. Without this, you won't get any renders out. Now, once you've done this, you can actually save this preset. So you can um, click Save as Preset and maybe whatever, Tutorial. Um, I can just call it Tutorial Preset. And now this preset is saved within this project. And you can see it's also loaded in here and you can then add it to any sequence that you want going forward. And that's also very useful as well. Well, with that all said and done, we are actually ready to press the render local image uh, button. Sorry. Once you press it, you'll um, notice obviously that your computer is now doing a subsample. So that's going to go to 64 and that's when the first frame will be ready. Um, and then once that's done, it will move on to the second frame. I believe the more the, the the you know the more frames you've got, the faster it will actually output these out um, because it will it will those sort of like build itself up to and warm up to the point where it's actually getting these frames a lot faster out. But now that because there were just had two frames, uh, they're pretty much done. And if I click this fold this uh, uh, link over here, this will open the folder. And this, these are the um, images that it just rendered out. So that's one of them, and that's the second one there, right? Obviously, we didn't do much in the way of setting up the scene or anything like that. I, we just rendered very quickly something. But uh, again, I think they're very, you know, they're very high quality. Um, they're 4K in this particular instant, and you can see it's quite a lot of detail in there um, for, especially for the texture in here. Um, let me just try and then move on to the next one. 
starting off like that. I just wanted to do that. And again, you know, um, I would definitely obviously refine this and do something else with it if I wanted to. But overall, this particular, th this is how you get these screenshots done. And it's kind of the same sort of methodology around um, uh, renders, cinematic renders as well. The same settings would apply, but obviously there, when you make like a video, you would obviously create an animation and you'd move the camera or the characters, whatever you want to do in that scene. Now, as a final part of, of what I'm trying to show you here, I'm just going to go through the post-process volume a little bit, just to explain a few things. So normally, once you drop it in the scene, it will look not it will not look like this because there's some things in here that I have changed, particularly the bloom. Uh, normally, it's um, standard. Um, so if I you know push this back to what it is, this is the standard bloom. If you look, that's how the sun looks like with standard bloom, and this is a lens flare effect. But if I change this to convolution, the way I do it, and then obviously I play around with the intensity, make it a bit less intense. But that's how the convolution looks, which is more expensive. And I wouldn't use that necessarily in a video game. Uh, I would just use it in, um, you know, in cinematics. Then the next thing that I do is I play around with the exposure. So I activate the exposure compensation and the min and max EV. Um, now, what this, um, what, this hap what this does, it controls how the exposure of the environment looks like. This is how it looks without, but when I put them to one, they will, you know, obviously for me, it's one because that's the setting that I wanted to use. You can use anything else, but because I'm clamping it down to a one and one, I get consistency within the scene. My exposure will look the same across the scene. Uh, but that those settings, I believe, I'm not sure if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, they still work even with this. But then the exposure compensation allows me to be able to brighten or darken the scene even further. So I keep that at, num at number one as well. Um, then other things that I do is I, I um, add in a dirt mask. So if you if you add a dirt mask, you know, this is this is uh, right now is deactivated, but that's the dirt mask right there. So the texture that you're seeing here comes in with Unreal. So you can just search in for dirt in here and you will be able to find it. And then you can put an intensity to it. So maybe, I don't know, if I put 150, you can clearly see the dirt mask there now. And obviously you can put that to zero and also change its tint if you want to. I uh, then also go into uh, lens flare and for this particular scene, I'm not really sure if lens flare really works, but you can add a zero, let's say 0 0.05. You can also add a bokeh shape, bokeh, bokeh shape as well, a custom one if you want, but you'll need to in, you know, you'll need to bring your own in here. You can also change its tint. So, you know, make it blue, make it red, whatever would normally work with your scene. Uh, but then also very important, I use a vignette as an image effect for space scenes because it really helps uh, out. Like for example, I could put this to two and it really darkens the edges, but normally a setting of one works quite well for me. And then if you want to do some more work in here with color grading, feel free. I've not done anything like that in here as of yet. Uh, some other setting, another setting that I use is the film grain, which is this particular part here. I normally use a 0 0.5 film grain and intensity of the shadows to one, uh, where, you know, where the shadows is just going to become more grainy rather than where there's uh, light, where it's lighter. But you can play around with this setting and make it a lot grainier if you want. So look at that. But if you do too high, then you can start seeing the repeatable pattern of the noise as well. So 0 0.5 for me really works very well. Um, and then I also make sure that I've got infinite extent uh, checked on so that it means that the process volume applies throughout the entire scene and not just where it, it is. So if I unclick this button, you'll notice that the post process gets deactivated because I am not currently within its sphere of influence. But with this button pressed, then it becomes you know, obviously uh, it encompasses the whole world. One thing to note is that you can set up a priority. So if you have two post-process volumes, then the one that's not got an infinite extent, that is maybe you are within it, within its volume uh, shape, then you can set that to a priority of, uh, I believe zero is better. So if you put that to priority one, then that will be uh, sort of second in line to be taken into account to override the other one. Uh, I can't remember now, to be honest. I haven't used that in a long time, but yeah. So that's pretty much um, that's pretty much it for the movie sequencer um, and and how to set up for cinematic screenshots. Uh, I hope you guys uh, enjoy that. But I hope you guys found to do today's uh, tutorial very useful. Um, I 
did struggle quite a bit myself with this in the past, but now I think I've got it all ironed out, so to speak. There's still a lot to learn, but overall, I'm getting some really good results out of this. I would like to uh, say a, a warm um, thank you to my uh, Patreons and any all the all the newcomers, all the Patreon newcomers who have been very supportive. Uh, they've really they're really um, you know increasing the quality of this platform. And, and I'm really appreciative of that. And also all the people that have purchased my projects on Unreal, on our station and Gumroad, hopefully soon on the Unreal Engine marketplace as well. I'm trying to apply for that. But uh, yeah, overall, I would like to appreciate, uh, I would like to thank you, the community. Um, I do appreciate your support and your feedback on the Discord server. Please feel free to join it and we can have further discussions there. I am always willing to help anybody that wants to uh, well, who seeks help. So I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Please let me know what you're interested in next. I might cover your topic. Who knows? And yeah, keep on creating.